Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Garst, NHIA Senior Director of Clinical Services and your moderator for today's educational session, updates on parental nutrition reimbursement and the new resource introduction. Today's program is generously supported by NHIA member Fresenius Kabi. Fresenius Kabi is a global healthcare company that specializes in life-saving medicines and technologies for infusion, transfusion, and clinical nutrition. The products and services are used to help care for critically and chronically ill patients. Fresenius Kabi's product portfolio comprises a comprehensive range of IV generic drugs, infusion therapies, and clinical nutrition products, as well as the devices for administering products. In the field of biosimilars, Fresenius Kabi focuses on diseases and oncology. In 2019, the first biosimilar product by Fresenius Kabi was launched. Within transfusion medicine and cell therapies, Fresenius offers products for collection of blood components and extracorporeal therapies. As always, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. The presentation is available for download from the handout section of the navigation pane. This webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you following the conclusion of the webinar and will also be available via NHIA's online community and in NHIA University. We will have time to answer your questions, so please submit your questions via the question tab at the navigation pane at any time during the presentation. Now on to our presentation. Joining us today to share their expertise are Penny Allen, the National Director of Nutrition Support for Optum Infusion Pharmacy, and Tom Silipetros, the Senior Director of Market Access at Fresenius Kabi. Penny began her nutrition support career at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts after obtaining her nutrition degree from the University of New Hampshire. She has spent over 30 years in the home infusion setting in a variety of roles and is currently serving as a nutrition support program lead for Optum Infusion. She is a certified nutrition support clinician, serves as immediate past chair of the Aspen Public Policy Committee, current chair of the National Home Infusion's Medicare Contractor and Advisory Committee, and is a published subject matter expert in Medicare PN and EN policies and other home nutrition support related topics. Tom has over 20 years of healthcare and pharma experience in a variety of R&D, strategy, marketing, business development, and market access roles with Baxter, ABV, Lundbeck, and Fresenius Cotton. Tom received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Loyola University, Chicago, and his Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I'll turn it over to Penny and Tom to get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Pregnant pause. Um, welcome to this afternoon's um, or this morning's program presentation, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, the title for the beginning of the talk is going to be Changes to the Medicare PN Policies After Three Decades. What are the implications for patients and providers? Next slide. So our learning objectives for today, um, in the beginning, we're just going to briefly go over advocacy efforts that led to the retirement of the previously obsolete Medicare policies for parental nutrition. We're going to review the new, not necessarily new, but new as of September 2021, local coverage determinations or policies for PN under CMS. And then three, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that remain um, with the new policies and how that's impacting access to home nutrition support care for Medicare beneficiaries. And we will touch on some of the challenges for providers. Next slide. A little bit of background, um, mo those of you that are on the call are probably NHIA members or are familiar with NHIA, but just to give the two second overview, the National Home Effusion Association is a trade association um, with leaders in home and specialty infusion. Um, NHIA provides grassroots advocacy, education, resources like our program today to the home and specialty infusion community so that the patients that we all serve can live healthy, independent lives. NHIA is committed to meeting the needs 
benefits of its growing and diverse membership and to advocating on behalf of our members and the home-based infusion patient. Aspen, for those of you that may not be in the nutrition support space, is the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Aspen is dedicated to improving patient care by advancing the science and practice of clinical nutrition and metabolism. Founded in 1976, Aspen is an interdisciplinary organization whose members are all involved in the provision of clinical nutrition therapies, including parenteral and enteral. With over 6,000 members from around the world, Aspen is a community of dietitians, nurses, pharmacists, physicians, researchers, scientists, students, and other health profess professionals from every facet of nutrition support clinical practice. So the reason why we're giving the background for that today is you'll, you'll come to understand the importance of collaboration amongst societies and agencies in trying to advocate and get change to happen. Next slide. So Penny, I know right, that when we were go ahead, Tom. this webinar, <laughs> kind of dropped on me the the fact that some of these, you know, coverage determinations have been placed in 1984. When I, mean, I think 1984, I think the top movies are like, you know, Ghostbusters, Karate <laughs> Kid, Indiana Jones, like Temple of Doom, and then all of a sudden they, they changed it last year, right? And that that's probably why we're getting all these questions. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? And, Absolutely. I think that's been the biggest source of frustration for those of us in the home infusion space, particularly those that are dealing with home parental nutrition, even more so than enteral, is that you know, CMS um, back in the day rolled out what they called the National Coverage Determination, which was really an overarching policy um, regarding PN and EN. I'll use that for, you know, instead of trying to spit out parental and enteral every two seconds. But the net net is that was rolled out in 1984. I, I bet that there were people on this call today that weren't even born in 1984. I know I was, but in any event, at that point in time, these therapies were placed under what's called the prosthetic device benefit of Part B the durable medi medi medical equipment um, benefit. And what that means is, we'll talk about this more, is they liken parenteral and enteral nutrition to a prosthesis. So if you're talking about enteral nutrition or tube feeding, the tube is taking the place of your swallowing mechanism. What is, you know, something is broken and not fixed um, and it's permanently impaired. If you're talking about PN, they're talking about the PN pump. So that really is the mentality that has been in place since 1984. For decades, we'll talk about this, agencies like NHIA, Aspen, the Ole Foundation, numerous other groups have lobbied for change to these policies because it isn't just patients that have a permanent impairment that need home nutrition support. So until 2020 really is when we started to see change, but that coverage criteria had never changed. Even though we've made advances in drugs like biologics for Crohn's disease, we've made advances in surgery, but we were still left with antiquated policies for Medicare beneficiaries. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to read this, I'm not going to bore you, but this is the exact language in the Medicare manual for those of you um, that want to go check it out. There's the link. Unfortunately, even with the changes I'm going to go through today, we are still under prosthetic device for home PN and home EN. So there are limitations to that. And we'll speak to some of those challenges in a little bit. But if you can try to remember the concept that you know, like a prosthesis, if you don't have a leg and you have a prosthetic leg, that organ is either not there anymore, that body part is not there, or it's completely not working anymore. And that's what the government likens home parental and enteral nutrition, which whether you agree with that or not, that's where it lives for today. Um, and there's a lot of documentation that goes along with that. The prescriber has to document that the therapy itself has to be for a long and indefinite period of time. And they call that the test of permanence. Um, and unfortunately, we are still left with that as of today in 2022, even though we've made strides to change the the, the level of detail within the policy. Today in the Medicare manual, other items that fall under the prosthetic device benefit are like artificial limbs, like I just described, um, cardiac pacemakers, prosthetic lenses. So this is a whole section of the Medicare manual. So um, until we can get some thought process surrounding that concept, that's where we're still living today. Next slide. 
So the former hierarchy of policies that we've been dealing with for those of us that have been in practice for a long time is, you know, you have the overarching Medicare benefit policy manual. You've got different sections of that. It's gigantic. And under the prosthetic device is where they place that original 1984 national coverage determination um, where enteral and parenteral lived. Um, about a year or so ago, January 2021, that was retired. So that went away completely, leaving us with what CMS or the DME Max call local coverage determinations. So these blue links, L38953, um, are, are the actual links to the new policies um, that were completely revamped. The A is the policy article. I mean, it gets confusing because there's a local coverage determination, there's a policy article, each associated with parental and enteral. So that's what we're left with today. There is no longer any national overarching policy that sets the tone. Next slide. So really, what were the barriers to access to care for beneficiaries or patients? You know, it really was that these items, both the NCDs and the old LCDs, hadn't been updated in greater than 35 years. And as I said, you know, we somehow, we, we change practice patterns. Um, we have patients today that receive home parental nutrition that perhaps in 1984 or 1978, you know, did not get TPN. Patients that have undergone sleep gastrectomy, for example, and they have complications post-surgery that requires them to have nutrition support. That wasn't as common back then. So the way that we test, the, some of the diagnoses, some of our indications have changed over time. Um, not all patients need long-term you know, permanent nutrition support. So that's still a challenge. And if you think about, you know, the way things were back in the 70s or 80s, if you've been around that long in practice, um, everything with PN was heavily weighted to that long-term, you know, permanent kind of condition like short bowel syndrome, Crohn's where there really wasn't any other treatments other than to put you on steroids and keep going back to the ER and taking out more and more and more of your intestine until you ended up with short bowel syndrome. Um, it didn't really allow for oncology related diagnoses, you know, different um, side effects from chemo, radiation, et cetera, that, you know, cause nutritional issues that might make someone need home PN or home EN. So again, that really wasn't in existence in the 70s or 80s when PN patients first started going home. So what happened? They often remained in the hospital or they were referred to a skilled nursing facility, which in truth is a much, much higher cost of care than being in the home um, to receive PN and EN if they did not meet the coverage criteria and therefore could not go home. And there's, you know, few and far between there are patients that elected to pay for the therapy themselves out of pocket, or they just went without. I mean, unfortunately, that's what we've seen too, is patients just didn't have nutrition support therapy. So think about all the consequences of that. Next slide. So what was the result of that? A lot of aggravation, a lot of frustration, right? Any of you that have worked in home infusion for any length of time, you know, you've dealt with physicians, case managers, social workers that say, what are you talking about? The patient doesn't have coverage. That doesn't make any sense. They have Medicare. They put into the system their whole life. They worked hard. What do you mean? Of course, Medicare covers that. You know, and there have been, I'm just, I've just got two examples of clinical abstracts that were presented um, by teams that I worked with over the last 20, 30 years. There's actually many more in the literature. If you follow up, I think every major home infusion provider has done an abstract or an article on this that really at the end of the day, only 10 to 15% of Medicare PN referrals previously met criteria until we made some changes. Um, therefore, think about it, 85 to 90% of patients did not have coverage for home PN under Medicare in the past. So again, I said the outcomes were people either went without care, went to a higher site of care, you know, like a SNF, an LTAC or whatever, some paid for it themselves. So to say that this has been a frustration for decades is an understatement. 
Um, and many times the companies were blamed for those of you that are, you know, on home infusion teams, you know, people in the hospitals don't care. They're just aggravated that it's Friday and the patient can't go home and they blame you for governmental policies. I've taken um, that bullet many a time. Um, and it's hard for people to understand that this isn't like Blue Cross or United or Aetna or whoever, Humana, um, where there's perhaps a medical director and you can go to a peer-to-peer -peer review or something like that. This is federal policy. You know, it literally would take an act of Congress to change it. Um, and that's li literally what we tried to do for years and years. So next slide. And it's, it's complicated, right, Penny? I mean, people don't understand how complicated it is and it's easy to assign blame to, you know, certain you know, organization without having kind of the full color and what, what's driving all these uh, decisions. So thanks for shedding light on that. Yeah, and we get it. It's really frustrating. Imagine you're a provider in the hospital, you have a patient, you know they're fully capable of going home, they have a loving family who's willing to care for them. Um, and then at the 11th hour when you're like, I'm sorry, you know, your patient doesn't have coverage and people are like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's that's what's really driven the ad advocacy efforts um, with many organizations, primarily Aspen and NHIA over the years. This is just a quick at a glance of the timeline of our advocacy efforts, really just 2020 and 2021. When I say I've seen files, you know, within Aspen where it literally was 20 years ago where Aspen was working with NHIA and lobbying to try to say, hey, can we get rid of the fecal fat test? That's just stupid. Nobody does that anymore. Can we get rid of, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, the albumin being used as an indicator of malnutrition. We, we all know that's not true anymore. Um, and it fell upon deaf ears. So that's really, you know, it wasn't that the efforts weren't there. I think it took a change in technology, a change with, you know, things being out in the open and transparent now where, you know, you, you, you don't write a letter and a medical director from Medicare writes back and says, sorry, you know, we're, we're not changing anything. They no longer can do that, not to put blame on them, but they have to be transparent. They have to put out an open, you know, forum for commentary, open forum for opinion, published commentary, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really, I think, what prompted us. Um, luckily, some of the long-term relationships and collaboration, Bill Noyes, who is the VP of Reimbursement and Policy at NHIA, he and I have known each other for well over 30 years. We both come from New Hampshire. Um, he always tells the story that we met on a ski slope, which is hilarious. But the net net is we know each other well, and we got back together and said, you know what? This is so aggravating. So many people are going without care. It's just not right. Should we give it another shot again? And thankfully, you know, I think what tipped us over the edge to, to getting an audience was that there were some changes with the four medical directors of Medicare. Um, and so some new blood, some open ears that were more receptive to looking at evidence-based medicine and, and evidence to, to support the notion of getting rid of some of the antiquated pieces of the old policy. And at the same time, the transparency, you know, to doing a reconsideration of policy, that whole practice change. So I'm not going to go through this in a tiresome way, but su suffice it to say it started with a meeting that we had with them, a vir virtual meeting in the middle of COVID, July 2020, where we presented changes that we would like. We presented the evidence to support that. Couple months later in October, this isn't what we asked for, but they just totally said they were going to retire and throw out the old LCDs completely and start all over again. And that led to a process of, you know, a number of us, not just NHIA and Aspen, but the Entral companies, the manufacturers, manufacturers that make the PN stuff, um, Baxter, et cetera, et cetera, um, Fresenius Kabi, you know, jumping in and saying, hey, this is not right. If you're a Medicare beneficiary, you need to have coverage. Here's some of the things that we're seeing. We're going to align with Aspen. We're going to align with um, NHIA. And at the end of the day, what ended up happening was um, they rolled out new LCDs, asked for comment, and as of September 5th, 2021, that's when the new LCDs we're going to speak to took, took place. Is it perfect? I'm going to say right out from the get-go, absolutely not. Is it perfect? Um, is it better than it was? Yes, somewhat. And I misspoke earlier. They finally threw out the old NCD. That was January of 2022, not 21. So 
we'll move forward to today looking forward that's how long it took literally decades to get some changes not total changes made the way that we think they should be so next slide all right we can skip to that the long and winding road next slide <coughs> All right. Yep. Those of you that have worked in the industry for a long time, you recognize this. This all went away and thrown out the window. All these decision trees. If this, then that. If that, not that. Da 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 da. This test, that test, etc. So thank goodness, after decades, these decision trees no longer apply. I know some of you out there. I bet you have this in your files. Throw it away. You know all the old stuff. I literally saw a checklist recently excuse me, from a hospital that was the old policy. So if you're working with any institutions and they have not updated their Medicare PN checklist, tell them to throw this all away. It does not exist anymore. Hallelujah. Next slide. So Penny, as we're going to the next slide, can you help the audience understand what long and indefinite means? Oh, that's a great question. And I think that that is the source of the most confusion with the policy changing. As I said, we threw out the old NCD, but the basis of that old national coverage determination was that permanent impairment piece. Um, in the old policy article, they actually spelled it out and said, quote unquote, ordinarily three months or longer was their definition of the test of permanence. I don't know why, but with the new LCD and policy articles, they removed that phrase. They kept long and indefinite duration, but removed the phrase ordinarily at least three months. That's created a lot of confusion for people because they're like, well, what does it mean? And if you log in to either CGS or Meridian, those are the two um, contractors of CMS that do all the administrative billing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they do educational calls. They review the new policies. And that question comes up all the time. And their response is, <laughs> it's a long and definite duration. They do not spell out what that means. So what we are left with is making an assumption that in the rest of that Medicare policy under prosthetic device, when we look to other policies that are under that category, some of them still say ordinarily three months or longer. So that's what we've defaulted to. We've asked for a more specific answer from CMS and the DME Max, and what they continue to say is the prescriber needs to say that it's long and indefinite. Now, if I asked you, Tom, what that meant, you know, what would you think? Well, you know, until I spoke with you, understood that. I mean, it's it depends on the person, right? And what they determine is long. It's all relative, right? What's long for me may be short for you, and vice versa. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's where it's a little gray area. Yeah. So uh, that's why I think it's important to educate the audience on that. I think it's prudent that we go with yes, some of the policy changed, but the overarching premise really hasn't. Now, thank goodness, we don't need a fecal fat. We don't need an albumin. I don't need a wait today and a wait three months ago. I don't need a list of all the um, motility drugs that you've been on, like before, to prove that someone really needs PN but we still need a permanent impairment of the small intestine which is where nutrition is absorbed for pn we still need long and indefinite duration for the therapy so i've heard we've heard from some providers within nhia that they have been audited or claims have been denied when the length of need was described as six weeks or eight weeks or four weeks so from that, I think what our goal, you know, Aspen and NHIA and OLE is to look at and track. Okay, the laws changed in September 2021. Let's take a look at what's going on. And thankfully, you know, part of NHIA, our mission on the Medicare Contractor Advisory Committee is to stay in contact with those four DME Max or regional carriers that administer the benefits 
and stay apprised of are we seeing any changes with audits? Are we seeing any de more denials? I is something triggering more? You know, and if so, what is that? And then we can go back and have a voice with them and say, hey, look, you know what? this is what we're seeing, you need to clarify this, et cetera, et cetera. So we're tracking it for today. The best advice I can give someone is stick to the three months or longer. You know, you don't have to write 90 days or longer, 90 days or longer, like everybody did in the old days till it became somewhat trite. You know, it's just what everybody wrote. Um, I think you have to be as crystal clear as possible. When you're asking someone to document in the medical record, how long they think the patient's going to need PN at home, be as specific as you can. I think it's going to be for the rest of their life. I think it's going to be for the next four months. I think it's going to be for six months to a year. I think it's going to be six weeks. And if you write six weeks, you're at risk. To me, six weeks isn't a permanent impairment. You know, so try to take a step back. You know, one competitive provider approached me at Aspen. We were standing at the posters and we did one on Medicare this year. And she's like, Penny, we're seeing a lot of denials. You know, here's what's going on. And as we went through the conversation, it turned out they were thinking that because the, the 90 days went away, that meant it was a free for all and they could take not a free for all. I'm being flipped, but they certainly were being more liberal in taking on many patients that needed four weeks, six weeks, da, 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 da. And this was a person who's been in the industry for a very long time. And I said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna keep watching it, it's new, but it, 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 with CMS and the government always err on the side of being conservative. So this language still exists in policies. The only thing that really changed is it used to say the judgment of the attending physician now, teeny bit more liberal, it says treating practitioner. So who could that be? That could be the nurse practitioner, that could be a PA, you know, uh, and that could be the physician or a hospitalist or a resident or something like that. Um, not a dietitian that comes up all the time, but the treating practitioner, who's writing the orders? Um, and they have to write it in the medical record. I can't say that enough times. I've been repeating it for 30 plus years. Not on a prescription pad, not on the diff, not on, you know, anywhere else, not verbally. It's got to be written in the medical record, which is a legal document. So, again, I know it's tough to go back and ask people to write things down. And then they wrote it on this and it's not the right thing. You got to go back and ask. You're at risk. That's all. It's your own risk. You take it or leave it. Um, if you choose not to follow that, it gives the government a good reason to deny and not pay your claims. So next slide. But I think, Tom, you hit the the nail right on the head. This long and indefinite duration with that elimination of the three months or longer has probably caused the most confusion. We used to have everything so rigid in black and white, and now it's a little gray and loosey-goosey, and that's kind of thrown things off a bit for providers. So again, not going to bang this hammer um, any harder, but it basically says, you know, the government says, we're not saying that things can't get better. If something improves, that's okay but we're not going to pay for a temporary improvement. Next slide. Um, sounds like a typical government type of uh, approach. Things, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to be negative. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, you know, Medicare patients, are you seeing an uptick on the amount of patients that are on a home PN compared to previously? Has that changed with the COVID pandemic? Are there still you know, people out there that don't have coverage, can you elaborate on that for a little bit? Okay, that's, that's a great question. I think we, we've got some stats coming up, but I'll touch on that now. Um, what we've seen, remember that 10 to 15% max of people that met the coverage criteria, and I want to qualify, that's just Medicare. That's not other insurance companies or payers. What we have seen in my company, we're, we're tracking this data, and it's been one full year now. Think about it, it's October 2022. So it was a year ago in September. Our one year of data from a national company with pharmacies all over the country is showing us that at about 45% of referrals that we get that have Medicare, straight Medicare as a primary payer, are now meeting criteria. So an improvement compared to 10 to 15. So definitely more Medicare beneficiaries or patients that doctors are saying they need PN are qualifying. So that's better. Do we have room to move that needle? 
absolutely. So what are the things that have changed that have allowed that? And again, a lot of text on this. The left-hand side is just a picture of what the new LCDs or policies look like. Um, but what, what's really changed is all of those tests and studies and things that we had to prove the permanent impairment, that all went away. Um, we do have to have a statement in the medical record that enteral has at least been considered. Maybe they tried it. Maybe they documented that mm -mm, this isn't doesn't make sense. We can't try it. Um, or they did try it and it didn't work. So a statement has to be in the record. That's a new thing that wasn't there before. Um, we did get them to liberalize the protein range. And what we're always looking at, you know, the Medicare Contractor Advisory Committee, any aspect of CMS is to reduce administrative burden is the way it's described. So the amount of paperwork we're making everybody do. So it used to be that the protein range for the PN script was 0 0.8 to 1.5 grams per kilo. And we said, you know, a lot of people today, they get higher amounts of protein for wound healing, for whatever the case may be. So they did agree and they allowed us, now the range is up to two grams per kilo. If the prescription has less than that or more than that, we need a note from the doctor explaining why. So that at least reduces a little bit of the documentation. Lipid dosing was a big thing. It used to be that only 1,500 grams a month were allowed. Doesn't matter what product. So think about it. The example we used with those medical directors was that's about 50 grams per day. If you're prescribing lipid appropriately, the recommendation is in the ballpark of one gram per kilo. That means that every patient who weighs more than 50 kilos we got to go back to that doctor and say, can you write another note explaining why you're giving this much fat? We don't have to do that anymore. The PN dosing is now, you know, as long as you're following manufacturer guidelines for the product that you're using, and Aspen has a beautiful little chart with all the products on it, and you can easily see what the ranges are. So if you're in the normal ranges, you don't have to get that extra documentation anymore. Um, and now the other newest thing is the treating practitioner has to have seen the patient within 30 days prior to initiation of PN. With COVID, we all know that that could be a deal breaker, right? Um, so, but as long as you document why, if the prescriber documents patient couldn't come into clinic, patient is immunocompromised, da, 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 da. And there's good documentation supporting that, you know, there's a way around it. So again, we already um, hammered the point that PN is still under prosthetic device, you know, under the what has not changed. Um, the calorie range is still the same. So we need extra documentation if a patient is getting 40 cows per kilo a day um, and explain why. And a lot of times this, this happens more when somebody is getting less than the 20 cows per kilo per day. Let's say you have a short bowel syndrome patient who gets PN five days a week or four days a week and you average it out and it's going to come out to less than 20. Or in the world that we're living in today, unfortunately, if your patient is obese, you're not going to feed them based on actual body weight. You're probably going to feed them based on an adjusted body weight. The government doesn't understand that. So don't think for a moment if you're a provider in home infusion, well, they're using an adjusted... They don't, they don't get that, you know, so if it's actual body weight, it's below 20, they got to write a sentence saying, patient's obese, we don't want to overfeed them, that's why it's 18 gallons per kilogram, so something plain and simple like that. Um, obviously, all documentation is required prior to the start of care, so the good news is, with the liberalization, we've seen an increase up to about 45% of referrals now meeting criteria and people being able to go home as compared to before. Next slide. That's great news. At least progress is being made. It's progress. It's definitely better than nothing. And there's a lot of us that thought we would never see any progress in our lifetime. So you have to take that um, as it comes. Here's the chart. You can go to nutritioncare.org and pull that off. If you're a provider and you're like, I don't know what each, you know, SMOF lipid, whatever, um, each lipid, clinolipid, intralipid, I don't know what their dosing ranges are. Aspen has a nice objective chart that tells you exactly what that is. Next slide. Okay, so we were just talking about more people meet the criteria. What are some examples of that? You know, um, in the old days, I'll do the GI example first. 
if you had a beneficiary that had a diagnosis of short bowel syndrome um, and they could not be maintained on oral or enteral, and it's clearly documented that they don't have enough functional small bowel to absorb, today they'll qualify. In the old days, let's say your patient had been, and this happens a lot, people are on PN for 20 years, 15 years, then they flip to Medicare. Okay, they have a 65th birthday or they finally file for disability. And you're like, oh no, they had Blue Cross before and they had coverage for the last 15 years. They've got short bowel, they still have short bowel, they still need PN. I don't have the operative report from 20 years ago, you know, and companies would be scrambling to try to dig through old records to find that because you needed the operative report showing that less than five feet of small bowel beyond the ligament of trites, you know, had happened within um, three months or whatever it was of starting PM. Um, today, you don't need that. You need the story. You need the subjective and objective information. But today, you wouldn't have to go searching back in the archives to find that operative report. Um, oncology, I used to say, assume pretty much no one with cancer is going to meet the Medicare criteria in the old days because it was really, really, really difficult. Meanwhile, we had plenty of women with ovarian cancers, endometrial cancer, you know, that had bowel obstructions that couldn't be relieved or whatever. Today, if the information is there, those patients would meet criteria if it's a permanent impairment, meaning it's going to be a couple of months. Maybe um, your patient has a stage three, you know, ovarian CA, they have a partial small bowel obstruction. You know, when you used to have a partial, you needed a whole long litany of stuff you know, to prove and you had to try a two feeding trial, today you don't have to do that. It depends on how it's documented. But today you have a partial small bowel obstruction and it's not gonna resolve anytime soon. And there's a length of need written, that patient will qualify today. Um, when you talk about surgery, I think I used the bariatric surgery example in the past. We, we unfortunately see patients, for most people with bariatric surgery, it goes fabulously well. They lose weight, hypertension and diabetes go away. Everything is wonderful, but there are patients that end up with complications. It's major abdominal surgery. Um, and we have some people that even today, we had a case recently, went to Mexico, get a bariatric surgery, come home, tons of complications, go to a center, try to get it fixed, you know, and, and that patient's on PN today. Um, in the past, it would have been really hard to qualify that. But literally, if that's a permanent type of situation, meaning more than a couple of months, that patient can meet criteria today. So those are some of the examples that people didn't qualify in the past and would qualify today. Next slide. We go to meeting is a slow transition with to moving to the next slides. I'm used to Teams and Zoom. All right, so I'm wrapping this up now so we can move on to Tom's portion. Uh, but really, when someone says to me, what, what needs to be in the record? What really needs to be there? You know, and I say, think about when you go through Joint Commission or ACHC or anything, what do they want to be able to tell from the medical record? They want to see the story, right? Patient came into the hospital. What was wrong with them? What's wrong with the GI tract? They were put on PN. Why do they need PN? What tests or studies were done? We don't need to pull those, all those tests or studies, but the story needs to be supported. Did you think about tube feeding? Did you try it? Or is it just not, it's crazy, like no way, we would never do tube feeding because of X, Y, or Z. And then wrap it all up and say, how long do you think the patient's gonna need PN at home? You know, it's got to be long and indefinite, whatever that means. So be as specific as possible. We know you don't have a crystal ball, Dr. Smith, but, you know, in your best judgment, that's the way the law reads in the treating practitioner's best judgment. So if you say, I think it's only going to be four weeks, you have to be truthful and write that. Because if you start writing six months for everybody, that is fraud. You know, and that's a felony. And, you know, there's an article coming out in Infusion Magazine, the September, October issue, where we go over, like, you got to be careful. There are federal statutes, like anti-kickback statutes, like, oh, don't worry, I'll take your patient, even though I don't have what I need, because you know what, maybe you'll give me some more business after. 
that's Medicare anti-kickback statutes. So you have to be careful with that. You know, if the doctor wrote four weeks and uh, two days later, all of a sudden the chart says now they're going to need it for three months or longer, that looks fraudulent. You're at risk. The doctor's at risk. You know, everybody's at risk. So keep that in mind. You have to be truthful. It's a legal document. It's a medical record. So my advice is always just be as specific as you can. And it, it may or may not qualify. And that's just the way that it is. We didn't make up the law. We don't necessarily like this part of the law, but it is what it is. And you don't want to end up in trouble with the federal government. So anything that's in the chart, you need objective information. It can't just be that the doctor writes one line on the day of discharge and says, this patient has a permanent impairment and is going to need TPN for long and indefinite duration. But there's absolutely nothing else in the chart that supports that. Unfortunately, we see that across the country. We look at records every day. So just be careful. You know, it is a pain in the neck. They're not happy when you ask them for more information. But at the end of the day, you're protecting the patient, the beneficiary, the family, so that they don't end up with unnecessary bills and financial risk. And you're protecting your company. So that's pretty much it. Um, that's where we're at today. So next slide, and I'll let, I think we're transitioning over to Tom in a second to learn about a new resource that Fresenius is offering to help us all with wading through these types of financial and reimbursement challenges. Same limited options we had before. <laughs> you could go to the next slide. When people, that other 55% don't need it, I'm not laughing because it's funny, I'm laughing because it's sad. Um, we're still left with the same backup options. Hopefully they have another insurance policy. These are the links when you get the PDF or the slide presentation, or you can go to cms.gov and pull them up yourself, just Google you know, PNLCD, it'll pop right up, ENLCD. I didn't really talk about Entral, but in essence, not a lot changed with the Entral policy at all. So um, that's why we didn't spend too much time on it today. Next slide. I think the next couple of slides we could probably buzz by. I think they're resources, articles, podcasts, if you go to the NHIA website, the Aspen, which is nutritioncare.org website, there's a lot of resources and information. But this is my call to action for all of you. Get involved, speak up. I didn't know how to do any of this until I joined a public policy committee. You know, click on the, the standard letters, write to your congressman, do, do whatever it takes to make our voices heard, involve your patients if they're up for it, they have the strongest voice of all, and then go from there. So I can't emphasize that enough, is just get involved. The only way we're gonna change things is by everybody speaking up and talking about how unfair it is that Medicare beneficiaries still don't have access to basic home infusion in 2022. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Penny. Thanks for laying the foundation for all of us. So I wanted to kind of give an overview of our company as well as you know kind of the, the new program that we're rolling out. So I often get asked, how do you pronounce your company's name? Because it's difficult. And I was like, well, it's actually quite simple, especially when you compare it to my last name. You know, I lose people when they say yes, they're already done. So it's pre pronounced Presenius Kabi. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, I've been with Presenius Kabi for two and a half years now. And one of the things that, uh, that we joke about here is that most of us consider it the best kept secret because a lot of people don't know about Presenius Kabi by name, but they know a lot of the products that they make. And so uh, I want to kind of give you an overview of, you know, Presenius uh, Kabi and how that relates um, to the organization. Ryan, next slide, please. So Presenius has been around for 110 years. People don't actually know that. And so that's a long history of, you know, reliability, innovation. Um, there's, you know, 100 countries around the world that we do business in. There's $40 billion in sales. There's almost 300,000 employees. So it's not a small organization. Now, within the Fresenius umbrella, there's four main entities, um, one of them being the Fresenius Kabi portion, which has the parental nutrition that we're talking about. It's got, you know, oncology, uh, small molecules, the biosimilars portfolio, Presenius Medical Care has you know, the, the renal centers that many of you may be aware of. The Helios and VOMED are mostly in Europe. Those are fo focused on you know, manufacturing, 
uh, health systems, hospitals, and, and managing them. Next slide, please. So we have, like I said, a global presence. And so there's 90 different centers around the world that whether it be R&D, whether it be uh, manufacturing, distribution, sales and marketing. And so that is something that, you know, we, we take near dear to our heart, but that also ensures reliability of supply to our patients and our customers, especially during the COVID pandemic, as we've seen how challenging, you know, the supply um, challenges that everyone faced, regardless of whether it was healthcare or technology or even the ability to buy cars because there weren't chips. So, so the redundancy that we've had has been extremely helpful. Am I able to go to the next slide? Sure. Technology, gotta love it when it works. And when it no. doesn't work slowly, <laughs> kind of at its mercy. It's like a delay, a painful delay. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, I it's Ryan. I may uh, recommend, why don't you guys go off camera and see if that will help potentially. Okay, I know good idea. Sure. It help with some of the bandwidth. Um, you can just let me know next slide. Is this the right slide, Tom? Yeah, so 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 that this is good for now. Um, so, All right. you know, Fresenius Kabi has made a huge investment in manufacturing and distribution capabilities. We've invested a billion dollars in the U.S. alone over the past three years to have these state-of-the-art manufacturing and distribution capabilities. So that's something that uh, that's important to us. Um, and so, again, the redundancy that we have across the world helps ensure supply to our patients and our customers. Next slide, please. And so here's kind of a, a look into our portfolio. You see the biosimilars, especially pharmaceuticals, is, is kind of, uh, you know, one of the uh, largest growing opportunities we have. Clinical nutrition, again, is, um, you know, kind of uh, what we built our name on, one of the things that we built our name on. Um, there's also infusion therapy, IV drugs, and transfusion therapies. I put the purpose there just for you guys to know because we're a very patient-centric organization. And caring for life is kind of uh, our motto. Um, and it's not, you know, just words, but it's also actions. You guys can use this potentially for dinners with your family or Thanksgiving when it's coming up. But if you look at the three squiggly lines next to the Fresenius Cabby name, those are not chairs. It's not a slide that kids go down. Um, it actually symbolizes shoulder to shoulder, um, whether it be HCPs or payers or pharmacies or um, patients or even ourselves. We're, we're shoulder to shoulder as we help patients on their treatment journey. Next slide, please. So Fresenius Kabi has been and will continue to be a pioneer in parental nutrition. Some of the innovative examples that Fresenius Kabi has had over the years include inducing alternative lipid emulsions, fish oil and omega-3s, and the first three-chamber bag into the market. So I think that's important to highlight. Next slide, please. So Kabi Care is a name of the patient support program that was created within Fresenius Kabi. Now, Kabi Care straddles our entire portfolio, and it's not specific to, um, to one product. What we do is that we have, you know, if you think of the umbrella being Kabi Care, we have different programs for different therapeutic areas, different programs for different products uh, based on the needs of the therapeutic area and based on the needs of that product. So some of the broad buckets are insurance support, financial support, therapy support, but again, this is not something that is uh, across the board for every single product. It depends on what the needs of that product and that therapeutic area are. Now, having said that, Care is not meant to replace HCPs. We do not give any medical advice. We're there to complement the efforts of, of you know, HCPs to help patients get access to, to the therapies that they need, um, including parental nutrition, which is obviously what we're talking about here. Um, Kabi care comes into play after the prescription is usually made um, to put the patients on the, the products that they need to be on. Uh, you'll see the website there, kabicare.us, if you want to learn more information about Kabi care and some of the programs that we have that supports uh, not only parental nutrition, but also uh, other products in our portfolio. Next slide, please.
So this is just kind of a quick overview of some of the things that our newly rolled out uh, Kava Care Nutrition Support Program has. It's primarily focused on insurance support, whether it be you know, benefit investigation, benefit verification of, of coverage that patients may have, whether it be assistance with you know, navigating prior authorizations or appeals, uh, coding and reimbursement. And so that's you know, what this program is about. And again, we need the enrollment form filled out to be able to, to help the patients and to help HCPs um, you know, kind of navigate this. Next slide, please. So we created a case to be able to um, help you understand some of the challenges that are typically faced, but also how this could be useful with the patient support program that we're rolling out. So next slide, please. Penny, do you wanna come up with the typical case that you're used to seeing? Sure, absolutely. Um, and again, for those of you in home infusion, you'll recognize this is probably a very, very common scenario. Um, so a 72 year old, female patient who's had long-standing Crohn's disease, you know, 30 years or greater, is experiencing a severe flare. Her GI physician is gonna change her biologic since the one she was on is no longer working. Um, during the interim time, uh, the physician decides that parental nutrition makes sense to sustain her since she cannot take much by mouth due to the exacerbation. Um, so she's probably got a little bit of malnutrition going on, but. Um, you know, she's got Medicare as her primary payer and the GI practice at this time is uncertain if she's got the benefits to cover the home PN. Great, thanks, Penny. So there's several layers of this, kind of like an onion that we have to peel back. The first layer is obviously from a Medicare requirements perspective. You know, introduction, uh, I'm sorry, it's important to understand all of the current Medicare requirements that Penny was kind of elaborating on in her presentation. Uh, the test of permanence um, that has to be met, as, as Penny explained, and that's kind of the first layer. Now, the next layer is from the patient side. A lot of times patients, they're not sure of what they have in terms of insurance. They'll say, I have Medicare. Yeah, but what does that really mean? Does that mean that they have traditional Medicare only? Does that mean that they have a Medicare supplement, a Medicare Advantage plan? Do they potentially have a secondary insurance where maybe their spouse is still working, so they're covered by some type of commercial insurance, um, even though they themselves retired? Um, even you know, plans within the same insurer could differ from state to state and be designed differently. So those complications make it difficult for not only patients to understand, but even HCPs to be able to navigate on behalf of patients. And so um, that's kind of the next layer. The third layer is from a provider perspective. You know, the, the provider may or may not know what insurance the patient has, if they're covered under insurance, you know, how do they ensure that they're going to get reimbursed for some services that they are providing for the patient? Because that's one of the things that we've heard, especially with all the changes that happened last year, we were contact, contacting and, and they were they were losing money. And it's not that they, you know, they're not a non-for-profit and they're not, you know, trying to, you know, uh, make money on patients, but they're trying to get reimbursed for the services that they provide. And so that's that's a challenge. Uh, what's the patient's out-of-pocket out costs? Can they even afford these treatments? And so what our patient support program allows us to do is provide insurance support for the patient, and sometimes it's for the patient through the HCPs um, to be able to do those benefit investigations to help, you know, determine if there's a prior authorization that, that we need to go through and, and an appeals process if that needs to be, uh, to be done. But again, none of this starts until we obtain patient HCP authorization on that enrollment form. Uh, I know we have a few minutes left, so I wanted to open it up to questions that uh, that have come in. So Ryan, uh, are there any questions that uh, you wanted to bring to our attention? Yeah, so great presentation, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started on some of the questions that we had. We'll try and get as many of them in as possible. So one question that came in is, why does Medicare not allow for predetermination of TPN coverage? <laughs> I mean, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> All right, you know what? 
I don't know. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Um, seriously, I think um, I think it decades ago it worked that way, but at some point in time things changed. So that's what really messes things up, or you know, depending on how you look at it. You, as the infusion provider, the PN provider, are responsible for knowing the law inside and out. You or us, we collectively, are charged with making that determination. You submit your claim. Let's say you think, I think I got everything. Patients got coverage. There is no predetermination like, and then you send it into Medicare and they go, oh, sorry, it's not covered. It doesn't work that way. It's almost like a backwards system, you know, and I'll be clean and not use bad language. It, it's a backwards system because your patient could be on for a year and something triggers an audit and then you get audited and you have to provide the supporting documentation. And if you don't have everything that you need, they can take the money back. So. Um, I think it's a labor thing. It's probably just, you know, the intensity of staffing, labor, et cetera, the change in the audit processes. You know, newer audits came about. I can't even remember. I think it's back in 2008. So things have shifted. It would be great if there was some kind of predetermination or they acted like a regular payer, but it doesn't work that way. You know, the onus is really on the home infusion providers, and that's that's why programs like this, you know, where we have to stay educated, we have to stay on top of it, you have to stay current, you have to throw away your old checklist, because the onus is on you. And if you don't gauge it correctly, when I started with my current company, I think my first month, they put a stack of charts in front of me and said, hey, do these people meet Medicare? And I went through every single one. And I said, no, they don't. You have to write it all off. Um, because people just didn't know. So and that's the point of doing education. So I wish that it worked that way. It doesn't. Um, I can't ever recall all the reasons why, but that did shift over the years. It used to be you submitted a claim, it either got denied or accepted. So you knew right from the get go. But the challenge now is we have some providers that just think they have coverage. We'd be getting paid for a year. And it's like, no, they don't. You just, the government could dig in. Once you have a red flag and the audits start, if they see that they're taking money back from you, like get ready, you know, that's their job. And certain recovery audit contractors get a cut of everything they take back. So that's the yeah, challenge you within the door. system. If you open up that door, then they go, go backwards further in time to see if there's more that they can. I would, yeah. I would. I joked once with my former executives that like, well, if you ever let me go, I think that's going to be my new job. I'm going to be a recovery audit contractor. So <laughs> that's my, that's my fall, yeah, that's my fallback job. So no, it's, it doesn't make sense. But again, I'm being flipped. But, you know, a lot of things are nonsensical, you know, about the way that things are administered. So that's why we have to keep speaking up and advocating for change and trying to get some element to reduce administrative burden, whatever it is, to make this process be as easy as possible so that we can take care of patients. And like you said, get paid for the services that we provide, because wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Ryan, do we have time for another question or are we out of time? Yeah, we have more I'm going to try and fit in here if everyone wants to hang out for a few minutes. But one of the other questions that came is, is it still necessary to do a trial of EN or document why it's not an option before CMS will cover PN? That is a great question. What shifted is you don't have to try it. You know, in the old policy, it just said a failed to feeding trial. So you either chose to do it or not do it. Most of the time it was inappropriate. Today, you need the statement in the chart that says Entral has been considered, tried and failed, found to be ineffective. So you need a statement saying that you thought about it and for whatever reason, it doesn't make sense, but you don't have to trial it like you used to in the old days, which could definitely you know, cause harm to a patient if it was inappropriate. So good question, you have to have a statement. Great, and I know we have a few extra questions and I'll try and get that information over to Penny and Tom afterwards, but I think this is a good one here. It's typically when a patient obtains Part B, so when they transition from and into Medicare Part B, which we know is a challenge not only for PN, but a lot of other therapies as well, we have to qualify them from their actual start date of TPN. So if it was 20 years ago, we get records from 20 years ago. Should we use the old criteria if they started TPN prior to this change? 
That is an excellent question. And I think at the NHIA meeting coming up next year, I'm going to address that a bit. I've already heard of some providers being audited because the government was using the wrong policy in their audit. This is the way it works. And we've at NHIA, we've clarified this with CMS a number of times. You have to use the policy that was in place when the patient started on home PN. So if your patient's been on PN for 20 years, they started 20 years ago, they've never come off, you have to go by the old policy. Every time you get audited, you are required to submit the supporting clinical documentation. So you're still going to have to produce the fecal fat, the operative report, the whatever it is, situations A through H. If you your patient started on PN in 2020, um, that limbo year, where we didn't have the new LCD, but they threw out the old ones. And the NCD was the um, was the guiding light, and that literally was for one year. You have to go by that. So it's very confusing. Um, and then if they started after September 5th, 2021, you are going by the new LCDs. So that's something to keep in mind. And again, like I said, a provider recently shared on our committee that they had been audited and even the government was using the wrong policy to audit them by. So it really requires us to stay on our toes and correct that if they do that, because it is confusing. There's no grandfathering in, you know, of, oh, just use today's policy. It doesn't work like that. Huge no, question. And I, I'm going to do one. Yeah, great question. Uh, one more quick question. And then again, for anyone that submitted a question, I'll get those over to Penny and Tom and, and, and try and they'll try and get back with you because there were a few, quite a few questions that came in and we are getting to time. So uh, one question I think is a pretty quick one is, do you get an ABN on, on all Medicare TPM patients because of this uncertainty? No, that's not what you're supposed to do. An, an advanced beneficiary notice is when you determine the patient doesn't have coverage under Medicare and you wanna bill somebody else. You wanna bill a secondary payer, you wanna bill the patient, you wanna bill the hospital if they said they're willing to pay you a per day rate. The ABN is really telling the patient, hey, you don't have coverage, you might be responsible, here's the reason why you don't meet Medicare criteria. You know, when in doubt, let's say you have a referral that comes through and you don't have all the clinical information. We had a case the other day where we didn't have the information for like a week or so. So we got an ABN because at the time of discharge, we didn't have what we needed to qualify the patient. So we generated an ABN. But to my knowledge, you're not supposed to just issue a blank ABN for everybody under the sun. You know, your job is to determine, do I have what I need to meet criteria before that patient starts care? If I don't, then yes, issue an ABN. Um, if you have what you need and you and your team have decided we have what we need, this patient is good to go, we can start them, then you do not need an ABN. Great. Thanks so much. And again, we're at five after, so I am going to wrap it up here for today. But thank you for all the putting questions. We'll get those over to Penny and Tom because um, there were quite a few more questions here, but I wanted to try and get to the high level ones. So thank you all for your participation and adding those questions in. And again, thank you to Tom and Penny for an excellent presentation today and for Fresenius Kabi for their gener generous support uh, of the program. Uh, as you close out the browser today, a short survey will pop up. So please take a few minutes to complete that survey. And as always, thank you to all of our providers and suppliers who are working on the front lines to keep our patients safely in the home. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you for sending us. Bye-bye.